Your stream has ended. Okay, I'll try to go live it again. Seems like we're live. Yeah, it it was basically asking me to uh, to stop uh, streaming. Strangely, so looks like the live looks like we have a session. So thank you so much uh, for all of you uh, to. No, for being here, uh, we already had this great conversation a couple of days ago. I um, like to do a very brief uh, introduction. Um, I, I guess uh, oh, start uh, with the the person who uh, sadly could not join us, uh, Rajiv Lutra, uh, who is in the program, uh, is obviously an important lawyer in India. And what happens with important lawyers that they have to be uh, to court, and that uh, seems to be the case today. So uh, to represent him. We have Asim Abbas, who is also part of the preparation call. So thank you so much uh, for joining us, Asim. Uh, when it comes to a small introduction, I guess uh, the, from the background uh, of uh, you know, being a lawyer yourself, uh, you work in telecommunications for many years, and this is your link or one of your links to philanthropy because of the Bharti uh, Telecommunications um, the Foundation. So I'd love to hear a bit more uh, about that. And um, you will also be telling us a bit more about what Rajiv was doing, the Pani Foundation, in terms of water management uh, in uh, areas that are affected by uh, this uh, kind of trouble. And um, thank you so much uh, for making the time. Uh, passing on to our uh, this second square that I have on my screen, that'll be Peter. So Peter, you get the second square. I'm not sure if you're happy with that result, but the uh, second square it is today. So Peter, I would like to um, tell the world that I consider you to be a, a friend. We have had uh, many of the sessions here before at Horazis, and you were a speaker at my event, the Wisdom Accelerator for Youth, uh, sharing your amazing uh, life story. And um, your life is just too long and too interesting to be uh, compressed in a, a few seconds. But I uh, would like to focus on the philanthropic uh, efforts that um, you've been uh, driving with the Other Dots Foundation. i um, love to hear uh, your experience there and uh, how that impacts uh, you know, philanthropy in Asia, uh, with lessons learned, and anything else you'd like to share with us. You specifically mentioned transparency, so that's a very important topic, and we'll get back to that. And the uh, final square that I have here is Munir. So Munir, we haven't had a chance to meet in person, even though we live in the same country. And um, you uh, are working with the Swiss Arab Network. I'm quite sure that lots of uh, philanthropic uh, angles uh, to what you do. But um, my understanding is that the oh here we have the Stuart <laughs> joining us uh, as promised. Uh, so the um, the RFI uh, Foundation uh, is the one that uh, I kind of uh, wrote down here. Uh, and the angle that we'd love to hear. Um, more about is um, the Islamic giving versus other cultures, right? So uh, how can we uh, make sure that we respect uh, uh, cultural traditions and have maximum impact uh, in, uh, in the way the capital is deployed? So um, with that said, for the introductions, guys, I would uh, like you to maybe get started uh, telling a bit more uh, from your perspective on what you've done that is relevant for philanthropy in Asia. This is a reminder, the uh, and topic of the panel is philanthropy makes a difference across Asia. And uh, we uh, want to uh, now talk about uh, how private donors can work with global institutions to maximize the impact. Uh, we want to focus on the needs management basis. So it's not only you, know, you like a certain topic, let me put some money there to help out, but it's also you know, uh, the people defining what is help from their perspective, right? So working with the people who are receiving uh, the benefits and um, especially where we can apply uh, those um, uh, efforts uh, in an effective way. So Osas, uh, would you ask him uh, if you could tell us a bit more about what uh, you and Rajiv uh, would like to share uh, here with us today. So thanks for joining and welcome to the stage. So, uh, so let's say uh, coming to the topic, uh, the Asian donors and the link link it with the global institution. So, so there is a saying which goes that if you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, go together. So, so the complex social problem requires unique and integrated uh, approach towards causes that requires massive investment like uh, global public health, climate, climate change. And these are beyond the capacity of any single player to solve. Therefore, 
uh, the philanthropist are adopting unique collaborative models together uh, and making sure that they get the scale and size adequate to solve the problem. Now, philanthropy uh, is a part of Indian culture. Most of the big industrial houses have their foundations engaged in uh, various activities like providing health facilities, education, elevation of poverty, etc. Uh, just to give you a figure that from 1892 till today, uh, Tata Trust has donated or contributed roughly around 102 billion US dollar in education, healthcare, and other sectors. And it's the biggest donor in the world. Uh, in India, uh, Azim Premji has contributed as well significantly for philanthropy. And in the last year, he has contributed more than a billion dollar. Now, the important thing and which is linked to the topic is how to link these donors to global institutions. Uh, and I think one very important factor is that there should be a trust these donors have over these global institutions. And this trust is to ensure that money is utilized for the intended purpose without any political or ideological consideration. And one way of building the trust is to ensure a transparency, sort of a neutral benchmarking by renowned institutions and maybe some audit rights of the donors. So these are my uh, sort of an opening comments. Can't hear you. Can't hear you, Marcelo. Sorry, I, uh, I'm, I'm still a bit ill, so I'm coughing, so I put myself on mute. So Peter, I'll, I'll pass it on to you. So thank you so much, Asim. Um, any comments on what Asim just shared with us and uh, what, what is your position uh, in terms of the, the topics of the panel today? Yeah, um, look, um, um, it's an interesting topic for me because uh, Other Dots Foundation is all about uh, the philanthropic side, which is, you know, what we're trying to do is to deliver a new... Um, a new way of education, as we call it, in the playground of tomorrow, and it's about using gaming. And when we talk about philanthropic, for us, it's all about how we can get contributions, or, or, or actually, what we're actually doing is trying to build a community of what we call dot leaders um, who can help us grow and um, participate in a, on a journey to give education or make education accessible to everybody uh, around the world, no matter where you are or who you are. And one way of doing that is through a $1 contributions. Now, um, I think I actually touched on two things that are really key, which is trust and transparency. And this has been a, um, a real pain for me or, or, or a real niggle for me because, you know, $1.1 trillion a year disappears. Um, um, we can be harsh and use the word stolen, which is probably actually what does happen. Um, and so no matter where you donate, the question then becomes, where does that money go? Where does that philanthropic money actually goes? And, and trying to, you know, you know, taking the point of how do donors, um, how can we, um, collaborate with the global partners, making sure that any donations that are made, are going to where they need to be, I think is a real critical, critical question um, that's, that's really jeopardizing the philanthropic work that's being done because people are now beginning to wake up and question um, where is money going? Why have we still got all these problems around the world? Um, and why are, are some of these developing nations around the world still suffering? When there's all this money being uh, donated, and I, and I always use the example of when I'm on a, when I used to be on a plane, no more at the moment because of what's going on. But when I used to be on a plane, the air hostess at the very end, as the plane was taxing, they'll come around to ask you to donate some money for, for, for the children, to save the children. The question is, is how do we know if that's really going to save the children? And what children are we saving? Do we know who they are? So, you know, I, I question all of this. And, and again, this is why what we're doing at the Other Dots Foundation is creating that transparency so people can actually see where their dollar goes, how that dollar is being used, and the outcome of that dollar. So they can see the progression, and they follow that in complete transparency, and it gives us our trust. The other thing that we do 
is we offer our bank statements to be seen to everybody. So people see exactly that none of the founding members draw a salary. None of the founding members draw any sort of expenses. It's all paid by their own pockets. Um, and, um, you know, we, we drive that, that process forward. So for me, when we talk about philanthropy, it's about also that trust and transparency. So two key words for me today. Well, thanks, Peter. So uh, we'll, we'll get back to a couple of points, including uh, how blockchain could be relevant to the transparency discussion. But I'd like to pass the word to Munir uh, to tell us a bit more about his background and uh, share his uh, no, opinions on the uh, topic uh, of the panel today. Thank you, Marcello, and, um, and also my panel colleagues. So very interesting, this, uh, this topic, and very important. So um, myself, I since the youth, I'm invested, or let's say I'm investing my time for, for philanthropic activities. So I started at a very young age to do uh, fundraising door-to-door -door, uh, for the um, Red Cross, so the regional Red Cross. And since then, ever, I'm, I'm engaged in philanthropy. And since the last 10 years, when we basically found it with a couple of um, uh, colleagues and friends, we started a network, a non-profit organization, basically building bridges between Switzerland and the Arab world. Philanthropy has become even more important. I mean, since then, we know not just the Arab spring, the Arab winter. We see a lot of, let's call it also southeast uh, or South Asian countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan struggling. And we were asking ourselves, how can we connect uh, basically the dots? How can we help NGOs um, and philanthropic organizations connect with the private sector? Because what, you've, what you see, for example, in, in Switzerland when looking at the money, the philanthropic money which comes from the private sector has been always the same. I mean, it has been steady over the years. It hasn't been increased. So the cake is always has always the same size. And and uh, but what we've seen in the last ten years is basically the more, the importance of know-how transfer. So many, for example, Arab countries. When you look at but also Southeast Asian countries or South Asian countries, they're asking us. We want know-how. We we do not just want your money on one side, but also we see a lot of more innovative finance um, uh, tools like impact investing, um, but also um, but also impact development bonds, microfinance tools, and what you know worries me a little bit uh, since maybe two years is that philanthropy uh, might has become um, you know not being seen in the right spot anymore you know because everybody thinks oh why um, if investors coming private sector what we see also with the SDGs the raise of private sector private money um, that we should use that one to accelerate however there is uh, there are a lot of cases where uh, philanthropic money is important because investors do just go in a portion of countries which which we see worldwide. For example, in Afghanistan, you hardly see impact investing or microfinance because the country risk is too relevant. So philanthropy, philanthropy has a, a big value there. And we need to ask also ourselves how to reimagine philanthropy. So... You know, that's uh, some activities we do with Swiss Arab Network, but also where I'm a trustee um, with the RFI Foundation, where we engage more and more now in Indonesia, but also Malaysia, thanks to our board of trustees, but also members there, and helping the banks convert uh, Islamic, but also uh, conventional finance. So that's a brief and a couple of topics I'm engaged in and, and interested in and, and see how to challenge or help to solve them. Oh, thanks, Munir. I would like to take a, a slightly uh, separate branch from our previous conversations here because Afghanistan is a, a good case. Well, it's not a good case in the sense it's not a good reality, but it's a good example of uh, an extreme sort of situation. So maybe ask him, uh, uh, you are you know, in India, so it's obviously a, a geopolitical reality uh, from your perspective, what happens in Afghanistan. So thinking about the topics of uh, getting global institutions involved, transparency, and um, 
the angle of uh, public-private partnerships. Uh, what uh, are your comments in terms of, uh, of philanthropy in the specific case of Afghanistan? Because it's on the news, right? So they definitely need uh, international help. But so what is the, uh, the regional perspective uh, on how we can help them? So I think Afghanistan could be sort of an extreme case where probably uh, uh, there was a lot of philanthropy, but there were a lot of other uh, geopolitical consideration with respect to that philanthropy. But coming to a public-private partnership, I think that's an area uh, which has done uh, uh, pretty well. And there are very there are many examples uh, where the donors, where the individual or uh, at the organizational level are collaborating and forming alliances with global institutions like UNICEF or OECD uh, to form action groups which are focused and oriented towards a common cause such as poverty elevation or educating uh, children. So the public-private partnership uh, model, I think, is a successful model, and I'll probably give you one uh, case study also, because in this model, there are various stakeholders uh, including a global institution, which play an important role. And they have different things to bring on the table. Some provides technical, financial and knowledge support uh, to create an integrated uh, implementation and monitoring framework at the ground level and also create a pool of uh, resources uh, to be a, a, in the form of aid or a technical know-how. Uh, so an example which I can think of is this uh, Village Social Transformation uh, Foundation in collaboration with the UNICEF as a knowledge partner, uh, really played a very important role in transforming roughly around 1,000 villages by uh, giving access to drinking water, uh, improving education, uh, reducing infant, and, uh, uh, infant mortality rate and increasing agricultural income. And the collaborating partners in this were uh, the big donors, the big industrial houses like Tata Trust, Hindustan, Unilever, Mahindra, Deutsche Bank, uh, Reliance Foundation. So it was sort of a collaborative uh, model in which the, uh, the donors and the global institutions who provided a lot of technical know-how uh, played a very important role in transforming roughly around a thousand village. So that, I think, is sort of a good example where public-private partnership has really worked well. And this is not one example. There could be a uh, lot of other examples. Yeah, the the questions we were discussing uh, when we had our initial calls, like when is it philanthropy, when is it uh, politics, right? Is a public relations um, uh, effort. And I think the case of Afghanistan is quite... Uh, specific because you have so many um, political reasons uh, involved. But uh, in some stage, you are so desperate for that kind of help that you just accept the fact that it comes with, with this uh, hidden price. And, you know, it's obviously a very big topic. We could uh, spend a lot of time talking about it. But I'd like to shift back to Peter to tell us a bit more about transparency uh, and how technology can help, right? Uh, blockchain technologies... Uh, have been touted to uh, uh, becoming potentially a solution to clarify where is the money uh, going and how it's being deployed. But Peter, from your experience, so, um, what do you think that uh, we can do in terms of applying uh, existing and uh, upcoming technologies uh, to improve transparency in the way that the money is managed? Yeah, look, I, I think uh, I think the world of uh, blockchain and smart contracts can certainly do this uh, for sure. And it's one thing that uh, other dots is, is keen on, on implementing. We work very closely with a company called ATEC, who are all about uh, transparency on the blockchain. And we use a platform that actually allows people to donate um, or contribute, if you like, to, to the, the case studies that we're working with in, in India and Cambodia. And people can actually will know where that where that money goes. Um, but where the technology really kicks in for me, and where smart contracts can play a really important role, is the activation of of things that happen. So, for example, you know, you, you can use the way a smart contract can be um, defined is a way of um, if milestones or certain situations have been reached, 
smart contract kicks in, money's taken, money's deposited, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, and it's all. And you know, remember, the whole purpose of the blockchain is this complete um, tamper-proof, transparency, encryption style. Um, and that's where the world of tokens kick in as well, where you can use tokens to be able to um, to deliver um, scenarios. So uh, I'll give you an example. We're working closely with uh, um, Janajal in India um, with the AT- water ATM system that they have. And one of the things that they're building is a, a tokenized platform where, you know, one token, you can buy your token, that token to, can be used to redeem, to grab water, etc. Now, again, what you can do is apply the whole blockchain concept and smart contract around that token so you know exactly what gets delivered at the what point it gets delivered. Um, but then more importantly, what are the outcomes of, of those things that then trigger another um, deliverable from a smart contract. So I, I'm, I'm definitely all for automating it. The, the, I guess the the issue that's there and you know for me the the biggest issue out there at the moment is this massive movement of wealth around the world okay that's moving around okay um and not everyone's for complete transparency not everyone's for tamper-proof things because it doesn't help with the particular agendas that are happening around the world but it's critical if we do want to um, progress and, and really, if we want the public and private sectors to really join, if we really want um, to move into a new wave of funding, philanthropic funding, then we have to consider the, the blockchain. We have to consider the world of smart contracts, the, the world of crypto as well, because that will give us that that chain, that, that closed loop that we're, we need to look at. Um, so, you know, I, I'm certainly all in favor. It's something like I said, we're, we're doing at other dots um, in how we can incorporate this for us. Um, but, yeah, it's, um, it's a very interesting space at, at a very interesting time, um, you know. And, you know, that, that going back to my movement of wealth is probably why Afghanistan is where it is today because of the money coming in and going out and no one knows where it's gone sort of thing, so... Well, uh, apparently goes to buy flats in Dubai in many uh, locations. <laughs> that's, that's the, the way that it apply uh, a lot of caps. And uh, uh, it's a sad reality. Right? But uh, and this is something that uh, we can definitely uh, try to do something about. But I, I would like to uh, give the word to Munir. We talk about uh, technology. So let's just shift into uh, people skills. Right? Munir, you uh, obviously uh, have uh, created the Swiss Arab Network. You are a people's person. Uh, you have been involved in philanthropy from an early age. So can you tell us a bit more about the, the role that uh, networks and uh, you know, uh, establishing relationships with the right people can have to activate uh, many of those uh, philanthropic efforts? I mean, uh, or maybe some examples of things that you know, took place with great results that would have never happened without the human trust uh, elements. Uh, from uh, your past experience? Yeah, definitely. I will also then uh, chip in to, to, um, to this important topic Asim and Peter have, have mentioned, just as a commentary. But to, to answer your questions, what we've seen, um, there was in the last years the opening of large organizations. I mean, maybe 15 years ago, it would have been very difficult to work with UNICEF, UNHCR, you know, with the global organization. And uh, since the SDGs and the, the kind of push and, and probably realization that you only can succeed if you mobilize private wealth as well, um, We've seen a lot of more openness. Um, now, the challenge for for, la- for NGOs, large organizations, is the way how they do fundraising has been quite of always the same, you know. And it's a challenge for them if they call up um, organizations, they immediately say, "Oh, oh, oh they they just want our money," you know. Um, you know, we anyway work somewhere, but. 
for these organizations it's important to to build trust to build the relation and and to tell them the story and sometimes it's not even that organization but this one can help them to do some well so basically it's a standard kind of networking getting into there getting getting the story out what what they are working on and like this basically um creating emotions and and trust in this organization this is where where we help um for example we are preparing with a large uh, a very famous ngo the next kind of a private sector round table where we invite um large uh, foundation for example here in switzerland high net worth individuals and design basically the, the the concept and then invite our network in the name of of naturally our network but also for for this um for these ngos to 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 present that or we create a sort of gala evenings which we did for Uh, UNICEF, um, uh, but also Hand in Hand International, the, the, the a large organization of, of Percy Barnabic, um, which, which he founded at the World Economic Forum, or at least um, uh, outside, you know, in the evening. So this is where we, where we try to, to create, but also when we um, organize conferences, like we've done with the RFI Foundation together, where we also try to showcase, you know, what, what Peter mentioned, 8Tech was, was an important one, was one of our challenge winners some years ago, there to showcase, you know, what they can do, how it works, um, just to, to build that bridge. Um, um, two, two topics which, which um, were mentioned by my colleagues were, were interesting, sort of... Um, the role of philanthropy in, in countries like Afghanistan, just to, to come back. I mean, there we need to ask ourselves when we look at pri uh, private uh, partnerships, you know, what can philanthropy actually do? Because you need a certain type of base infrastructure, be it energy, be it health, be it probably also uh, education, where philanthropy can be an accelerator But at the same time, you need the government because it's, it's, it's government work and it's, it's very difficult to subsidize. Or if you step in, you need to make sure the government at a certain time is taking over. So that's maybe one aspect there. Another aspect is certainly what do you do with the type of, let's, for example, refugees where no government is actually Uh, feeling responsible for. We had a lot of engagements with UNHCR on that. And now this connection between the, the let's say, Asian donors with, with large institutions, the, the challenge and, and the call we are, we are giving out there is there is a fundamental design problem. Um, for example, if you go and want to help Um, Muslim-majority countries like Bangladesh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, but, but also on the other side, Indonesia, Malaysia. So we have a quite um, people-rich countries, Muslim-majority countries. What we say is, if you design your philanthropic aid and, and help, you need to consider the end person, the end donors. And there is Islamic giving can help a lot, uh, build trust, but also transparency. Because in, in Islamic giving, you're not allowed from the part of the donation you, you, you give, take something for the foundation itself. And what I'm saying, saying to, to many NGOs, and we also helped a, a couple there, uh, was, was basically a lot do that already you know what peter is telling me the cause on education for example or the transparency you're providing with bank statement you're doing it voluntary you know in 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 essence it's it wouldn't be probably too difficult to make that an islamic giving around or at least a halal or islamic um a compliant way how you do that and that you know can help as well to provide uh, trust, you know, what we discussed at the beginning is the challenge uh, on it. Well, thanks, Munir. Uh, I think it's about time for us to open the floor for any comments from the other speakers. Like, is there anything we discussed so far 
uh, Peter and Nassim, would that you like to get back to to continue uh, on a specific uh, focus, or should we just move on to the rest of the uh, agenda? Let's go. After you, Asim. After you. So I, I can give an example of uh, uh, the people's movement, uh, which is reflected in uh, Pani Foundation. Uh, so Pani essentially means water. And uh, this mission was to create a drought-free Maharashtra. Maharashtra is a province or a state in India through people's participation. Uh, and this was achieved essentially by mobilizing and training citizens in Maharashtra with requisite social and technical skill, uh, fostering social unity amongst villages and providing a very simple solutions and technology. So it was sort of a people driven movement and this movement was created with a lot of fun activities. But the end result essentially was to create an environment that the villages uh, in Maharashtra are drought free. So, uh, uh, so and, and, and it's filled up really rapidly from, let's say, 116 villages in 2016. Uh, it reached to roughly around 5,000 villages in 219. And the volume of water storage through a tank, which was created in this period, was uh, around 500, 550 uh, billion liters. There were a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, sports or fun activities which were uh, organized around the theme of uh, water conservation, soil conservation, creation of uh, water ponds, and somebody who was a winner was given a prize. So it was a people-driven movement which eventually uh, achieved the desired result and created uh, uh, thousands of villages in Maharashtra, which earlier was drought-free with uh, sufficient water air. That's a great example. So. Uh, Peter, you, you wanted to, to jump in because I have a question uh, for Asim uh, after that. No, no, no. Continue, continue. Because uh, I'm, I'm just trying to digest the thought that I have. So please continue and, I'll, and, and I can jump in after. Uh, so, uh, Asim, the, the question is, a pie is a great example. What are the core elements, like having fun and expanding uh, via community? Uh, which elements do you think that could be used for other philanthropic efforts? Because... As mentioned during your previous call, water is so essential that it's easy to get people um, committed you know, to doing something about it. Right? So it's something that is perceived as a basic uh, uh, priority because if you don't have water, and nothing else really matters. And that's not only the amount, but also the quality and accessibility. So which of the, let's say, three top learned lessons from the Pani Foundation's success which you think that could be applicable to any sector of philanthropic uh, efforts uh, in Asia more specifically? So uh, I think with respect to Pani, it also depends upon, let's say, what is the intended objective. Here it was essentially water conservation and it was more or less the natural water, its conservation. So it was a simple solution, simple technology, and this could not have been possible without people's participation. So for this sort of an activity, which essentially deals with conservation, I think the single most important thing is people's participation. Uh, and pe and how, do you, how do you design uh, a system where people are involved? Because uh, to connect people with the activity, that's a sort of a great thing. Uh, in Pani Foundation, it was designed as a sort of a fun activities with lots of incentives in terms of prizes and all. Behind, behind that, there was a huge machinery which was working. There were people who were uh, contributing it, giving aid. But in Pani Foundation, people's participation was the single most important factor, probably followed with the right kind of people who were involved in it to design it in a manner that people participate and then the fund. But for instance, if the focus is medical facilities, for instance, as a part of a philanthropic act activity, then there the most important, I think, would be uh, the donors, the aid, that you create an infrastructure so that the needy can uh, help and get their medical facility. But for an activity like Pani Foundation, I'll put people's design in a manner that people participate 
in is number one, followed by uh, the skill set of the people who are managing it, and then probably the aid. And what about the legal structure? You, know, you having a um, uh, lawyer um, background, um, is that an association? I mean, what are the elements that you need to have so that people understand the rules of engagement? So there are various ways in terms of creating uh, a legal structure for a philanthropic activity. There is a concept of uh, charitable trust. There is a concept of creating a company under the Companies Act. Uh, so there are two, three uh, uh, vehicles which legally can be created for uh, the charitable trust. Under the Companies Act, there is a, a corporate social responsibility also if the company achieves certain threshold in terms of net worth, turnover or profit. They have to contribute uh, for the corporate social responsibility. That contribution could be to any other trust, uh, charitable institutions or Section 8 company. And this, when this money goes there, under the General Income Tax Act, there are a certain benefits uh, the donors or the contributor uh, can take. So there is uh, uh, sort of a, some tax incentives or exemptions given for the contribution uh, made for a philanthropic or a chari charitable institutions. And there is also a system in place where it's mandatory for a company when they achieve a threshold uh, to do a corporate social responsibility. Okay. Uh, just a, uh, one more point there. We discussed that before. Um, the tax implications in the United States, you have the 501c3 corporate structure. And a lot of giving happens because people get a tax break, you know, frankly speaking. Uh, you're telling me that in India that is uh, also the case. So there are benefits and uh, I'm absolutely in favor of those if they're uh, implemented correctly, they can uh, make a tremendous difference. But what about the other Asian countries? Are you familiar with the uh, structure in uh, the rest of the continent? Could you elaborate a little bit more in terms of uh, why philanthropy doesn't happen? Let's say Afghanistan, as we mentioned, the country, I'm assuming they don't have that level of sophistication of giving tax breaks, right? So the, the money that goes there doesn't provide any benefits uh, to the donors other than uh, the in intended uh, benefits uh, from a philanthropic perspective. But could you comment on what other countries in Asia uh, are doing uh, in terms of uh, tax benefits and fiscal advantages of uh, philanthropy? Uh, not very sure, actually. Uh, let's say the general comment is that there's, uh, there is uh, the, the proportion of people donating money to charity uh, according to the World Giving Index, is 12% points higher in nation, which offers some form, form of tax incentives to individuals than those that offer no tax incentive. So wherever mm -hmm. there are tax incentive, the proportion is uh, higher as for this. Uh, not very familiar as to what other Asian countries are doing, but I think we can explain it a better. But in terms of, let's say, a Muslim majority country, there is a concept of zakat is a sort of a philanthropic activity contributing money, uh, 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 contributing money for the philanthropic activity. Uh, but that is given irrespective whether there is any tax benefits or not. It is sort of a, a religious obligation. And if we collect that uh, amount of money, it becomes very huge because it's some percentage of, of the income which goes to the society at large. So maybe in... Uh, uh, Muslim majority countries, despite there are no tax incentives, but there is a concept of a zakat. Uh, it is generally given. Yeah, uh, thanks so much, Asim. Uh, so, uh, Peter, would you like to get back to your points that uh, you mentioned before? Yeah, one of the things that, you know, what, what I've been trying to digest here is listening to the conversation. You know, and um, for me, each of us can do our part in our philanthropic side, whether it's, uh, a, I guess the word, for, the, the issue that I'm trying to digest is this whole tax incentive part, because it, is that a driver to be philanthropic, all right? Or are you being philanthropic from the heart because you're passionate, because you want to do good? I don't want to do good knowing that I'm going to get a tax break. I don't really care. 
okay? It's about, you know, when you walk the street, you see homeless people, you see people begging in the streets, okay? I'm in Milan, and I've seen them all over the place. The question is, are they really, are they really suffering, or are they, or is this a, a group of people who have got together, and, and, and it's a, you know, it's a, it's a business, okay? It's fake in that sense. So I can still do my philanthropic good, so I do it differently. I go and buy them a sandwich. I buy them a coffee, okay? And I'll say to them, I'm not going to give you money. Here's food. And the amount of times people look at, they look at me to say, well, I'd rather have money, which means it's not, uh, it's not what it's intended then. That money's not what it's intended to do. So I, I will question the tax part because, for me, you, any philanthropic investment should be because you want to do good in the world, not because, oh, I'm going to make a tax break at the end and I can file it. And, and, that, and I guess that's the driver for some of the big organisations as well, that, you know, if we allocate, you know, 100,000, 200,000 a year for corporate social responsibility, which is an old term now, it should all, for me, it's about corporate social innovation. Right? How do we innovate to be philanthropic in a, in a, in a world that's changing so rapidly today? And even if you take today, in the world of this pandemic, where you have developed countries who are getting all the vaccines, but the non-developed countries are suffering, okay? Where's the philanthropic effort there for me? Why are we not making sure those who are not privileged are getting the so-called vaccine? And this, for me, is the manipulation of the system we live in. Um, and again, trust, transparency, etc. So that's what I've been trying to digest this conversation because, you know, I can take £10,000 if I want or dollars, euros, whatever. I can go and donate it. But is that money really going to go to that person who needs it or to that community who needs it? And that's what bothers me. And that's why, again, I'm going to go back to other dots is what we're trying to drive here. We're trying to drive a new thinking, a new mindset, a new deliverable where people's uh, your contribution is really going to make the difference, okay? It's not going to go into my pocket or Stuart Hutton's pocket, who's a founding member, or, or, or other free, free members. It's about going to where it really needs to be. Um, so, sorry, I'm just was trying to digest everything and just spilling it out <laughs> as it is. It's always challenging, right, because uh, we, uh, we're covering the topic of uh, global institutions and partnering with them. And it's a stark reality that uh, they uh, want to, well, they, it's basically their fiduciary duty to maximize shareholder profit. Right? So if they can use philanthropy as a mechanism to achieve that objective and people benefit in the end, they are you know, doing their part within their constraints. And you're having a different angle. I, I like giving food to homeless people as well. Because uh, then you, you know that it's very unlikely they're going to be selling that food to you know, use the money to buy drugs, right? It's just making it harder for them to misuse the funds. But I think there is space for all sorts of approaches. The work that Other Dots is doing is uh, really great. Um, I think that's what um, lots of companies are doing, saying, I'm only giving when I have a tax benefit. It, it, it's at least... Uh, very honest, like, you no, know, it is um, a well understood reality. And if in the end of the day, you have people who are benefiting uh, from the uh, the actions, uh, we should uh, foster those uh, as well. Right? And uh, just one comment, because you only have one minute left in case you want to have any parting thoughts. Um, it, it's very hard for a nonprofit to scale without having the overhead costs covered, right? So in, in the case of Islamic uh, funding, uh, oh, like when you just share a little bit with us, how does that get funded? Like if you're, you're not allowed to spend the money in paying for the, uh, the office lights, uh, how do you make sure that infrastructure is in place for you to be able to get the work done? Yeah, yeah. Um, at the end, it's it's two different donation flows. You know, you you really raise donation, let's say from institutionals or so, to cover your your um, overhead. But the donation that is given by the specific people, you 
you go out and, and give that 100% for the cause itself. I mean, in, in that sense, you know, it also creates transparency, trust, because you you totally show what the money does and where where it goes. You know, maybe to end, I mean, I know our session is ending there, but I think important is also for many NGOs to look at partnerships, because often you see NGOs, foundations, to be driven by their ego because a lot can do the work better, let's say hand in hand international created in the past 10 years, 4.11 million jobs alone in India. And many foundations meanwhile see, okay, they have a way how to do it better because they basically refought their business model. And this is maybe something which, which we might also need to rethink and, and say, okay, we have a use of technology, but maybe there are other foundations who can do the job on the ground better than us. Why do we not share um, basically strengths there and not do the cause ourselves just to sell it afterwards? And this is where I think there is still a lot of potential and leverage around um, we, we can use. That's great. So our session um, just uh, finished a minute ago. We can stay a, a bit longer. I would like to uh, invite maybe Asim, you can give us some uh, final thoughts and then uh, follow with uh, Peter and Munir, if you want to add something else, please. Unfortunately, I've got, I've got a shoot because I've got a nine o'clock call. I've got a, I've got a Zoom I've got to get to, but uh, always fairly enjoyable. I think uh, definitely all, she's all stay in touch and because uh, I think this, 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 this topic is, is great. It really is. Thank you for sharing today. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. And enjoy the rest Bye. of the horizons. Cheers. Bye -bye. Uh, so I think uh, I probably, uh, what uh, Peter said, uh, that also very interesting thought that this philanthropy should come from within. There should be a passion rather tax incentive being a driver. But then I think subsequently what you mentioned that even if it is a driver, at least it is giving benefit to lots of people. Maybe it is because of tax incentives. So I think the first is the philanthropy flows from lots of concepts, lots of philosophy. But if the end result is good, uh, whether it is coming out of passion or it's coming out of tax incentive, uh, I think I'm perfectly fine there. Yes, I think there is also important to distinguish who is doing the donation. Probably an institutional client or institutional organization is, is more intended, you know, to, to be driven naturally by tax incentives as well or to put that into their equ equation rather than a private person, you know, with, uh, with, with, a, with a specific cause there. But yeah, definitely something to, to look at. Oh, that was great. So, thanks so much for the wonderful discussion. I, uh, I hope you enjoy uh, the rest of Horizons. So, try to jump in a few more sessions. And I hope we have a chance to meet in person soon. I see in New York is a bit complicated because you're not a side of the world. But, Munir, maybe next time yes, I can do sure. like, we'll grab a sure. coffee. And thank you, uh, Marcella, for the moderation. Very much yes. appreciate it. Thank you, Marcella, for moderation. We'll be in touch. Thanks. Bye bye. Okay. Thanks, Munir. Bye. Thank you, Asim.